up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Long Lens Podcast. If you're new here, this is a Q&A podcast where I answer questions from my YouTube filmmaking community. And I also sometimes have guests on this show. But again, bread and butter of this podcast is a Q&A. So the way it works is I always answer my Patreon questions first. There's a bunch of other exclusive perks on Patreon. So I'll have that linked in the description below. And if you're watching this on YouTube and you don't know, I do have an audio only version that you can find on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. I always like to preface this podcast with saying that I don't have all the answers and I don't know everything. So just take what I say with a grain of salt. But I have been making videos for a while. And so I just try to answer the questions to the best of my abilities. Also, I am dealing with a little bit of a cold, so if I sound even more nasally than I do normally, that's why. Okay, so I'm pretty stoked because we have a few questions on Patreon, and then we have a few SpeakPipe questions as well, which if you don't know, SpeakPipe is a place that you can go and leave an audio recording, and then I play it back here on the podcast, and you have a little cameo on the podcast. But yeah, Patreon questions are always gonna come first and I give the people that ask them on Patreon a little shout out. So let's start with the first question on Patreon is from Ramal Persad. And Ramal asks, hey man, so I have three questions. The first, what do you say is better, video bit depth or bit rate? How would a 10-bit video at 400 megabits per second at higher hold up against a 12-bit video at a lower bit rate? Now, in that specific situation, I don't necessarily think that you would see such a huge difference. There obviously is gonna be a difference with more bit depth and like more color depth in your footage. For instance, I'm pretty sure a lot of like raw codecs are gonna be shooting in a 12 bit color depth as opposed to 10 bit. But where I think you'll see more of a difference is a 10 bit video versus an eight bit video. 10 to 12 bit, it's a little bit less noticeable, but I would definitely say eight to 10 is very noticeable. Again, if you gave me an eight bit image that was like 600 megabits per second, or a 10 bit image that was only 150 megabits per second, I would take the 10 bit image because I favor color depth as opposed to bit rate. So you can have a really, really high bit rate and have a really sharp image, but if it doesn't have a lot of color depth to it, it's kind of hard to manipulate in post. So even 420, 10-bit, 150 megabit per second footage, I think is gonna be easier to work with and grade than 8-bit, super high bit rate footage. So, so that's just how I think of things. I'm not a colorist or a color expert, but that's kind of where my mind goes is I'm always gonna favor color depth as opposed to bit rate. All right, the next question is, do you think the Mac Mini M1 used is sufficient for 1080p and 4K video editing? Now, I've never used a Mac Mini. I have the M1 Max MacBook Pro with 64 gigs of RAM. The only thing that's not maxed out on my M1 Max MacBook Pro is the hard drive, but everything else is maxed out. And it cuts through stuff super, super easily. Now, I've never used a non-Max version. I went straight from a 2019 to the, the 2021 M1 Max. And I haven't had any hiccups with it. Like it can cut through everything that I do like butter. I know that the the Apple Silicon chips are really efficient. And for the most part, you can edit stuff even on the just the M1s. But I would say that if you could save up a little bit more and just get an M1 Max with like as much RAM as you possibly can, I think you're going to be a little bit happier or look for an M1 Max, Max Studio, that could be a good option. I know, I mean, if you're on like a budget and you're trying to like save money, then yeah, maybe an M1 Mac Mini might work for you. But I think that as soon as you start stacking your timeline and dealing with, you know, GPU heavy effects and stuff like that, you might start seeing it slow down a little bit. So if you're on a really tight budget, maybe you could look into the PC route. But again, I, I personally like when I upgraded from my 2019 MacBook Pro, I knew that I couldn't afford, I think the M3 was already out, but I knew that I couldn't afford even the M2 Max or the M3 Max. But I knew that the M1 Max MacBook Pro was gonna be such a huge upgrade for my 2019 that instead of going the PC route or getting a super you know, base model Mac, I knew that spending a little bit more and getting a refurbished M1 Max MacBook Pro was the best way to go. And I do not regret that decision. So unless you are doing insane edits. I would say that the M1 Max MacBook Pro is more than enough. Even if you are doing insane edits, I haven't I haven't figured out a situation that I can slow down my M1 Max MacBook Pro and I edit in like Adobe Premiere Pro, which is not as optimized as Resolve 
or Final Cut. So if I am not finding any problems with an M1 Max MacBook Pro in Adobe Premiere, you could probably do a lot with maybe not even a maxed out M1 Max. So that's, I hope that helps. Maybe that didn't exactly answer your question, but that's, that's where my mind goes. All right, and the last question from Ramal is, are you a craft beer guy? Honestly, no, I don't really drink beer all that much. I'll drink a hard cider every once in a while if I'm, you know, out with people and they're drinking it. But for the most part, I don't drink any alcohol. I am really into kombucha, which I know is a very like <laughs> Portlandy thing to be into, but I like the taste of kombucha and I don't like the taste of beer. So go figure. All right. Next question is from Ivan Martinek and Ivan asks, hi, Nigel, you've been the biggest inspiration on my video making journey. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Ivan. That's rad. Could you make a video showing your color grading flow here on Patreon or on YouTube? Yeah, I might make a video maybe just on Patreon, just giving you like a really quick rundown on my color grading workflow. I think it's pretty straightforward when it comes to most of my cameras that I shoot on. If I'm shooting on like maybe like a obscure camera that isn't supported by Film Convert, then maybe I'll do my own LUTs for it. But a lot of the times, I will just color grade my stuff using LUTs. So like with my S5-2X footage, I don't really feel the need to make LUTs for this specific camera because there are so many good ones out there that I can recommend. And the ones that I use are the Phantom LUTs. They're a little expensive. I think they're like 50 bucks. And uh, Joel from Malaro makes them. They're supposed to look very, very close to the Arri Alexa. So that's what I use. And yeah, I use the S5 2X LUTs that he sells on my S5 2X and my GH5. Sometimes I don't, sometimes I use Film Convert. It's a pretty straightforward uh, color grading process using the Phantom LUTs and I just do a couple of tweaks here and there. But yeah, I love the Phantom LUTs and I can highly recommend them. But yeah, I might make a video like that on my Patreon page if you're curious to see like the different steps that I take before I actually like apply a LUT and how I tweak the LUTs. So, but yeah, other than the Phantom LUTs, I have been using some other ones that I've been finding on like the far corners of the internet that are kind of designed for Rec. 709. Again, maybe I'll talk a little bit more about those on Patreon. All right, the next question is from Joel Kimball. And Joel asks, I shoot weddings in a Sony A7S III and A7 IV. I really want a C-cam, but I had the FX30 and hated the image, which is difficult to match with my other Sonys. Do you think a GH5 or a GH5S would be easy enough to match with Sony, particularly matching S-Log to V-Log? And would I be able to trust the autofocus to stay locked on the bride while it's at about 20 feet away with me on a tripod? Well, I mean, the first thing is I, it's odd that the FX30 doesn't match well with your A7S III and A7 IV just because they both, I mean, they all shoot in, you know, S-Log. I'm not super familiar with Sony, so maybe there is some color differences. The GH5 is a great camera, but you are definitely not gonna be able to rely on the autofocus when you're shooting something like a wedding, especially if you're used to the autofocus of an A7S III and an A7 IV. So I wouldn't say that it's the best for that specific use case. I mean, if you just set the autofocus to a single point and not continuous, obviously it'll just stay focused right there, but obviously do not use continuous autofocus. It will pulse and you'll be pulling your hair out. Uh, Vlog L is a pretty easy color profile to match with other cameras. Now I'm pretty biased, I use Cinematch by Film Convert and Cinematch matches cameras on a sensor level. So it's really good to match cameras up and even convert one color space to another. So converting Vlog L to S Log 3 is pretty simple. And you can do a lot of exposure and white balance adjustments within Cinematch, which is really nice. So I would say maybe look into a different Sony camera that you think might match up with your A7S 3 and a7 IV a little bit better. I don't really know what the difference in sensor and color technology is between all the different Sony cameras, but if you do end up getting another Sony camera as a C cam, um, I would consider looking into Film Convert because again, it'll match the cameras on a sensor level. And so you should be getting very similar looking images. That's all I can say. I don't wanna be a huge Cinematch shill, but I use it literally every single time. I'm gonna be talking about that because I already listened to one of my SpeakPipe messages, but I'm gonna be talking a little bit more about Cinematch here in just a second. So 
City Match is definitely something that you should look into if you want an easier time matching cameras to cameras. I don't really know what other camera to suggest. If you're already in the Sony ecosystem, I don't necessarily think it makes sense to go with the GH5, even though I love that camera. I would just try to look into finding another camera from Sony that you think might work better for you. That's kind of hard because it's like really the only camera that I can think of that's in that C-cam space. You could probably find another Sony a7S III maybe for not too much. Those are really the only thoughts I have on that. I'm sorry, I'm not more of a help. But those are the three written questions on Patreon. I do have another Patreon question, which is on SpeakPipe. So I'm gonna play that for you right now. And this one is from Nolan Natasha. Hey man, how's it going? I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the DJI Osmo Pocket 3. I got a feeling that maybe you got a video coming out on this, but uh, I'm just curious about how you're liking it, how you're using it, and particularly if you're shooting in their log format. I picked one up and I'm totally loving it, but I am finding it a little clunky to shoot in log and mess around with like tiny ND filters. It takes out some of that like instant access to nice footage factor that is like a main reason for owning the camera. I'm worried about being able to match up footage shot in auto and the standard profile with my log from my G9 Mark II. So yeah, I'm wondering if you've got any tips for matching non-log footage, really from any camera, um, to log footage, uh, because you don't have the same cine match option um, that you do when you're using two different log profiles. Anyway, love the channel. Thanks so much. Bye. So yeah, thanks for that question, Nolan. And I do love my Osmo Pocket 3. So I do have a little ND filter on my Osmo Pocket 3. It's from newer. It's really cheap, but it works. And I use this when I'm filming outside to just keep my shutter at 1 50th. Now, I know that that kind of does slow you down. And this is supposed to be just like a quick grab and go camera, but I'm just a creature of habit and I just cannot shoot an auto with it making my shutter speed super fast. So that's what I do. Now, I know that there are a lot of people on YouTube that just use it in auto and they just let it auto expose for everything, which I think still looks perfectly fine, especially if you're just using it as like a behind the scenes vlog camera. I don't think that you need to have that perfect 180 degree shutter all the time. But what I would recommend is even if you are shooting an auto exposure, I would still shoot in D log M. You mentioned cine match and that's, I'm just going to go right to it. That's how I color grade this uh, pocket three footage right now is I convert D log M to V log L and then I use my GH five LUTs right on the pocket three footage and it works perfectly. If you watch my video on the Laua 14 to 60 video that I just released, all of the behind the scenes footage of the actual camera that was all shot in D log M and I used a V log L LUT that I have on this and on my GH5 footage and it looks almost identical like the colors and everything look very very similar so that's how I shoot with this camera I use an ND filter and I shoot in D log M and I just dial it in just like a normal camera but on the very rare occasion where I do take the ND filter off and I just don't want to have to worry about it I will shoot in auto exposure but still d log m so i still i'm getting that log profile that i can switch to v log l inside of cine match because cine match does support the pocket three that's the way i do it there is very complicated ways of trying to make your own rec 709 to log lut inside of like da vinci but that takes a lot of like color grading know-how maybe i'll do a tutorial on that that's kind of the process that I take whenever I make my Cinelike D to Vlog L color space transform LUT. I did that inside of DaVinci and it's a very strenuous process that you need, you know, you're going to need like, you know, a color chart and you're going to have to like, you know, match everything up with two different profiles. So you're going to have to have footage shot in something like Vlog and then shoot the exact same image with the Pocket 3 and then try to match them. So it's a little bit complicated. What I would say is if you want the Osmo Pocket 3 footage to look as good as it can, shoot in D-Log M. It's gonna give you the most dynamic range. And if you already have CineMatch, just convert D-Log M to V-Log L. And if you don't wanna use an ND filter like I do, just shoot in auto exposure in D-Log M. 
and I think you'll be golden. So uh, what I found is I like to shoot either, if I'm gonna be shooting an auto, put the exposure compensation to like a half a stop down so that you're protecting the highlights. When you blow the highlights on this, it's kind of hard to bring them back. So I'd rather have a little bit of grainy footage bringing up the shadows than having clipped footage with my highlights. So that's what I do on the Pocket 3. Hope that answers your question, Nolan. Thanks for sending it in. Okay, this next question actually came in last month, but it came in a little bit late where I'd already released episode 59. So this is a question from last month and it's from Devrin. And this is what Devrin has to say. So um, I'm like kind of a daily vlogger and I've been wanting to get into more cinematic shots, like where they're just still shots. But like, I already have the Pocket 3 and action cameras which is the insta 3 go s and the action 4 i just want to know what camera can i pair with that that you know has lenses should i go with panasonic or any other type of brand i just want a basic affordable setup where i'm not spending thousands of dollars you know okay do you have an affordable price point or a setup where it's just vlogging and getting cinematic shots sorry if this is too long. All right, thank you. So yeah, thanks for that question, Devrin. That's kind of a hard one to answer only because I don't know if you are wanting a camera that is also gonna be really good with autofocus like the Pocket 3 is. What I'm gonna guess just from what you told me is that the Pocket 3 is probably your walk and talk to camera type of setup and you just want a camera that has a little bit better quality that you can just set up on a tripod and get like static shots, which I think is what you said. So you could go for something like the GH5. I love this camera. This is a 12 to 35. It's not gonna give you the most shallow depth of field, but I use this camera all the time. I've said it before, but I like using this camera more than my S52X. So this is an option, but something else that you could look into, which might be a better fit for you is the new ZV-E10 Mark II. It's under a thousand bucks. It doesn't come with a lens, I don't think. I think you can get the kit lens for like maybe 1200-ish. I'm not 100% sure. But the ZV-E10 Mark II is good. It's gonna give you 10-bit footage. The only problem you're gonna be dealing with is it's gonna be overheating for you, but I think that for a daily vlogger camera, that can be a perfectly good option. You're just gonna have to set aside some money for some lenses so that could be like a pretty good three camera setup the zve 10 mark ii osmo pocket three and then i think you said you had the insta 360 go if you're just doing like you know quick clips here and there i don't think that the overheating issue is going to be a big deal for you but if you wanted to save some money you could get a gh5 and some pretty cheap lenses for under a thousand bucks so this could be a good deal too if you don't need things like good autofocus and good low light performance because the GH5 kind of struggles in those areas. Okay, and the last speak pipe question that we have is from Sam. So let's see what Sam has to say. My name is Asimo Samuel Khaleb. Uh, you can call me Sam. I'm a big fan of your channel. I've watched it since you were using the Olympus uh, cameras. I have a question about the VB99 batteries. I just really want to know how long does it last if you are shooting i'm always i'm always afraid every time i'm shooting i'm always afraid about battery life and i'm always carrying around uh, a huge amount of batteries and in the past batteries have let me down i just really want to know how how long does it last while it's powering your camera and your monitor at the same time also, I want to know if you will be trying out the Shinobi 2 anytime soon. It's a very powerful monitor. I'm sure you have seen it everywhere on YouTube. I just want to know uh, what you think about it, if, if it is a good purchase for your work. Specifically, I really, I really trust your, your, your test. Thank you. Hey, thanks for that question, Sam. Yeah, so let's first tackle the batteries now. This is the VB99 that Sam was talking about, and I do really like this battery. I actually just shot an event yesterday where I had this trickle charging my camera, and let's see what the battery life is at. We are at 82%, and I was filming for about three and a half hours trickle charging my camera. So 82%, you could probably go for an entire day shooting trickle charging your camera with this battery. I think it will change a little bit if you're just straight up powering your camera and a monitor. So I would say on the safe end, you could probably go at least six hours yeah, powering your camera and your monitor with this. Granted, you're shutting them off in between shooting. If it's just, just like a straight six hour session, maybe not. But 
I've been really happy with this VB99. I think that if you wanted a battery that you wouldn't have to worry about whether or not it could charge your camera all day, the new Caleb Pike 212 battery, that one would probably be your best bet. I think that can power your camera and a monitor and whatever else you want all day, no problem. So I would look into that if you're really concerned about just wanting one battery that can just power your camera all day. As far as monitors, I haven't really read too much about the Shinobi 2, but my opinion on monitors, if you have one and you like it, if it's not broke, don't fix it. So I have the OC Lilmon 5. This one was sent to me by OC. I did a whole video on it. I haven't needed or wanted anything more than this. This is $189, 1,000 nits brightness. It's got a, a DC input in the back so you can power it, and it's a locking one so you can screw in like a power cable. The HDMI ports are on the back and not on the side, which I hate. I hate when the HDMI ports are on the side of the monitor like that. It's one of my biggest pet peeves. It's got an SD card slot here so you can you know, install your LUTs. I just keep mine in there because it's a cheap little 16 gigabyte one. Yeah, it takes Sony MPF batteries and it's great. You can install LUTs. It has all the different features that you want. It's touchscreen. Like the Shinobi is probably great, but this is also great. It's perfectly viewable in daylight situations and it doesn't break the bank. So this is the one that I use and I haven't really needed or wanted to get a different monitor. So, and it's not to say that the Shinobi 2 isn't good, it probably is amazing, but I have this and I'm happy with it. And I think that if you find something that you like and that you're happy with, it doesn't make sense to constantly upgrade unless it's actually slowing you down. And this hasn't slowed me down at all. So I like I like the, the Lilmon 5 by OC. So I'm gonna have some affiliate links to the OC Lilmon 5 and the small rig VB99. And also I have a special link for Cinematch and Film Convert, which you can find in the description below. Buying from those links really helps support me and this channel. And it makes it so I don't have to constantly do sponsorships or anything like that on either this channel or my main one. So consider buying from those links. It really helps me out. Okay, those are all the SpeakPipe questions, and now we're gonna go into the YouTube community page. Now, there's only a few here on the YouTube community page, so this should be really quick. All right, first question is, what is the coolest thing you've gotten to film? I mean, back in the early days of my video career, I guess, I got to film a lot of really cool stuff down in California. I shot with Zach King from Final Cut King. I don't think he's called Final Cut King anymore. He's just called Zach King. But yeah, I filmed a video with him and this YouTube channel that I worked for called Beyond Slow Motion. We did a whole egg fight thing where all of his friends from college, they all threw eggs at each other and we filmed it with a super slow motion camera. So I got to help film that, film some stuff with Jack's Films. We filmed like some slow-mo stuff, just like, I don't know, dumping milk and cereal on his head. That was pretty fun. And then the Powell Peralta team, I got to film with them back in like, this was back 2012 or something like that. So this is a while ago, but we filmed some slow-mo stuff with them and we like put chalk on their skateboards and had them do tray flips and stuff like that. And then, you know, seeing it in slow motion was really cool. Back in like the 2012 era, that was when like slow-mo stuff was just like really on the rise. So yeah, I got to film a lot of really cool things with like some big YouTubers even back in those days and then, you know, a professional skateboarding team. So yeah, those are some pretty cool things that I got to film. Since then, I've probably got to film other cool stuff that I just am not remembering right now, but off the top of my head, filming stuff with Zach King and Jack's Films and the Powell Peralta team, that was really memorable. Oh, and that same time period, I was helping with behind the scenes stuff of a shoot with Killian Martin, who also rides her pal Peralta, but he's like that freestyle skateboarder. And I got to film with Brett Novak, who's like a legend in the skateboarding community. So the next question is kind of a long one. It's, hi Nigel, my question is about the Lumix 25 millimeter F17. I happen to have it right here. It's less sharp or wide open than the Olympus 25 F18 and not as sharp as the Lumix 25 f1.4 there are those who complain that the aperture at f1.7 is not very good but it's the cheapest most advantageous in cost why do you value the lumix 25 millimeter f1.7 and what aperture do you shoot in and one more question what size of monitor do you consider the most versatile and is there an on-camera monitor with universal brightness okay so first let's tackle the 25 millimeter f1.7 I've never had a problem with the sharpness at f1.7. I had a back focus issue back when this first got released, but I think it was fixed with firmware updates. 
Now, coming at lenses from a video mindset, with how sharp our sensors are, I don't think that, like, I'd actually like a less sharp lens so that I get, like, you know, less moire and less hyper detailing. If you're a photo person, maybe you're going to think differently, but I actually like that this isn't the sharpest lens. I think that it adds a little bit of character to my videos. I actually have a black diffusion filter on this, a one eighth, just to, you know, bloom the highlights and soften it a little bit more. I've kind of stopped caring about the sharpest lens on my camera ever since I switched to shooting in 4K. Maybe back in my GH3 days, I would have cared a little bit more if this lens was sharp or not. But honestly, I don't really care that much about lens sharpness. I just care about the price to performance ratio. And this lens is very good. I think I got it for 90 bucks on eBay and I don't think I'll ever sell it unless I get rid of all my Micro Four Thirds stuff because it doesn't make sense. It's not gonna be worth it. I like this lens a lot. I have had the Leica F1.4 and it's great weather sealed and everything, but this is actually better in that it can focus closer than the Leica can. I'm not sure how close the Olympus can focus. I've never used the Olympus 25 mil, but I think this is a great just lens to have just because it's so cheap. Am I gonna do a professional photo shoot with it? No, would I shoot a professional interview with it? Yes, I would, because honestly, with again, how sharp my GH5 is, I don't think that most people are gonna tell that this isn't the sharpest lens on the planet and I don't want it to be. So those are my thoughts on this lens. As far as the best monitor size, I think that five inch is pretty good. There are some monitors that are like 3.5 inches or even 4.5 inches, which might be a little bit too small for some people if you don't have great eyesight. A lot of people like seven inch monitors because they're just, you know, it's gonna give you a bigger image. I don't know about universal brightness. If you're asking like what the brightness should be, I think a thousand nits is a pretty good spot to be at. Anything brighter than that is great, but if it gets lower than this, I know that the small HD Focus 5, that one had a, I think an 800 nit brightness and that one you could still see outside. So 800 might be the cutoff point as far as like outdoor viewable screens. So this Lilmon 5 is 1000 nits brightness. It's plenty bright enough to see outdoors. So that's what I would say is like the bare minimum when you want brightness and outdoor viewing. All right, and the last question for this episode of the Long Lens Podcast is, hey Nigel, I need your advice. I'm currently using a G85 and have a few Micro Four Thirds lenses like the 25 and 50 millimeter from TT Artisans, manual and cheap, but I'm loving working with them. I've been thinking about upgrading to a better camera that has 10-bit footage and open gate built-in LUTs. The cameras in my budget are the G9 Mark II and the S9, but the S9 would mean I would have to buy lenses again. So which one would you go with? The GH and the S5 series is out of my budget for now, or maybe I should just save more and get the S5 too. So please suggest, thanks a bunch, I love all your content. That's definitely a, a hard choice. I'm still in the camp where I have two vastly different lens mounts and I have, you know, I have Micro Four Thirds and I have full frame lenses. If you have a G85 with Micro Four Thirds lenses already, the G92 is a pretty good upgrade, although, it has come out in a recent video, I forget who the creator is, that there's an audio issue with a G9 Mark II. I would definitely say that if you could save up a little bit more, the S5 II makes more sense. Since you don't have a bunch of expensive Micro Four Thirds lenses, it's not like you'll have to be sacrificing this huge collection of MFT lenses. I think you could sell the G85 and you know all your lenses and maybe put that towards a a full frame lens or maybe some vintage lenses for the S5 II. The S5 II is just a really good option for the price. I think I've seen it for around 14 or 1500 bucks on eBay and that's just, you're really not gonna get a better image for that price. And I know you can get the S9 for around the same price, brand new, but again, the S9, even with the firmware updates, is still not gonna be as versatile as the S5 II because the S5 II isn't gonna overheat on you and it's a flagship camera. The S9 is more of just like a travel photo friendly camera with really good video features. So if I was in your position, I would just say goodbye to Micro Four Thirds because you're not honestly that invested in it and just go straight to the S5 II. It'd be a lot harder if you had a huge collection of Micro Four Thirds lenses and the G9 Mark II would just be a natural progression for you. But I don't think that it's going to be the hardest thing for you to just say goodbye to Micro Four Thirds and just skip right up to the S5 II. I think you'll be really happy with it. 
What you're seeing me on right now is the S5 Mark II X, which is the exact same camera, just a couple of internal and cosmetic differences. I think the S5 II is probably the way you want to go. Anyways, those are all the questions that we had for this episode of the Long Lens Podcast. This is episode 60, which is crazy. I think I've been doing this podcast for going on three years now, which is gnarly. I do one to two a month, but yeah, I'm getting closer and closer to that 100 episode mark, which I'm stoked on. I should have a guest on soon. I know I say that every single podcast episode and then it never happens, but this time it's actually going to probably happen. <laughs> Anyways, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Feel free to leave a comment. If you're on YouTube, leave me a rating or a review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. I really appreciate it. But anyways, thanks again, and I'll see you soon. Bye.